So it's the oh, okay. So it says it's recording and now it's live streaming. So uh, I would turn off the sounds, you know, it's, um, I don't have control on, uh, let me see, can I do that? I, if you go to participants. Uh, play sound, yeah. We, I, okay. Can you go to your office? Can you, uh, um, how's the situation there? Or the university is closed? So uh, they asked us to stay at home. So, but I I can go there to pick up stuff. Like right. I, I mm -hmm. forgot something in my office. I can get in and out, but we are not expected to be working from there. Right. You, you have students? uh yeah so you do everything through zoom like like us yeah mm -hmm. we do and so you're home and and yeah home i'm home office? yeah well my home office is my living room <laughs> my wife took over my <laughs> my office <laughs> all right One so Richard is here. Hi, Richard. You're muted, but I can see your name, but not you. I haven't seen him in a while. Wow. Hi. Hi. Hi, Richard. Hello, Raymundo. Oh. Hoping to see some of my group here. They got the email. Oh. Okay. Maybe they're on YouTube watching the yeah, live stream. Mm -hmm. All right, Pizia, you're in charge. Okay, I think we can start. Oh, okay. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new. Uh, to this week's uh, quantum matter seminar. Today we have the honor to receive Professor Teresa Paiva from Rio de Janeiro. She's enjoying the tropics and summer, which is coming there. Uh, uh, if you have any questions during her talk, feel free to unmute yourself and do it. If you prefer, you can also uh, type your question into the chat box and then we can read it for you. So uh, let's get it started, Teresa. You can share yeah. your slides and start. Let me see how I do this. I am, I think that's, that's the one. So can you see it? Yes. Is it like full screen or? No, I think you should, you are using preview, yes. So is it, is it okay now? Okay, yeah. great. So uh, thank you, uh, Christian and Adrian for having me here. And I think I thank Christian before, but not Adrian for organizing this. Uh, it's pretty bad that we are in a pandemic, uh, in pandemic times, but I am enjoying going to seminars around the world and being in Brazil, this is not something I would do regularly i feel really away from you know the mainstream but this gives us that are far away an opportunity to to interact more often so in a very weird way i am enjoying doing this so what i i chose to talk about today is the critical temperature of the 2d attractive hubbard model and here in the corner i think you can see my uh mouse i have like the summary of my talk but i'll get to it uh, in detail and tell you what's this about 
So the summary of the talk is I'll start with the motivation and then I'll talk a little bit of the about the attractive Hubbard model and what's already known and a lot is already known in about this model. And then I'll discuss the symmetries and this has to do with the question Adrian asked by email whether how this is related to the repulsive Hubbard model. And then I'll, I'll talk a little a bit uh, some very recent experiments and why we need accurate da data for the costly trials transition in this uh, model. And then I'll, I'll come to the conclusion and outlook. So the basic motivation to study uh, the attractive Hubbard model is code atoms in uh, optical lattices. And I'll start with uh, this cartoon, which is very nice and just reinforces that bosons and fermions are very different things. And uh, this, show, this uh, shows a, a trap and here bosons to the left and fermions to the right. And we can see that when we have bosons, we can have a condensate when we cool down the system, all the atoms go to the ground state. And then when we have fermions and here, I've drawn uh, two uh, spin uh, species, then they cannot, because of uh, Fermi principle, go all to the ground state, and we have this Fermi degenerate, degenerate uh, system. And in the experiments, the most used uh, atoms are lithium and potassium for the fermions. So uh, because they are so different, uh, boson systems are easier to cool down. And here in 95, the Bose-Einstein condensate was first achieved. And it took like four years for the degenerate Fermi system to be achieved. And this is just a sketch of the two uh, states that were attained. And uh, what I want to reinforce with this plot is that also uh, the temperature is harder to get and to find in this system as compared to the bosonic systems. But I am really more interested in a system where besides the trap, we have a periodic potential. And here are sketches from a review from Emmanuel Bloch of how we attain this periodic potential. So uh, counter-propagating lasers here, there are four, here there are six, and in this case, we have a 3D lattice. And uh, this uh, now very famous sketch where we have this egg shell-like uh, potential with atoms sitting in the minima and red and blue atoms are different species. And if you change the, the direction of the uh, counter-propagating lasers, we can have more fancy geometry. And a lot has been done in the past almost 20, 15 years. But the, the thing that interests me, and I think interests people that come from condensed matter backgrounds, is that we can have the same physics in strongly correlated fermionic atoms in optical lattice and strongly correlated electrons in materials. And the idea here is to emulate strongly correlated Hamiltonians in optical lattices. So uh, the most studied one is the repulsive Fermi Hubbard model. And I'll start with it. So in this uh, easy looking, but not easy tra treatable Hamiltonian, we have this three terms here, uh, a hopping terms, where we can have electrons going from one side to the neighboring side. And I am only consider, considering near neighbor hopping. And we do have uh, repulsive interactions in this case, where whenever two fermions meet in a single site, they experience uh, repulsion U. And I have written this term in a particle hole symmetry form, and I will come to it in a bit, uh, why this is important. And also we have a chemical potential here that regulates the amount of particles we have in the system. So it, if we want more or less particles, we change the chemical potential. And although it's 
uh, a simple form, there is no known analytical solution for this model in 2D. And yet a lot is known. This model has been proposed in the early 60s to study ferromagnetism in materials. But the basic thing is we have a competition between the repulsion term and the hopping term. And this tends to localize the electrons or fermions in the lattice, and this tends to localize. And at half filling, we do have a mod transition and antiferromagnetism. And this has been seen in optical lattices. The first time the mod transition was seen was back in 2008. But I think this uh, more recent uh, papers and, and graphs with uh, where we do have the quantum gas microscope are really nice and really uh, didactical to understand what's going on here. So this is uh, a, a plot that shows where it's blue, we have one atom per site and where it's empty, we either have two or no atom per site. And here we have this whole region. This is just pixelized where a single atom is you know, on each side. So this is a clear picture of the mod state. And this is uh, for a two-dimensional system. And as for uh, antiferromagnetism, it's uh, harder to see because the ordering temperature is lower. And also because we do need to be in 3D to see uh, long range order in the Hubbard model. And I'll come to it in a moment. But this experiment from uh, Hule group in, in Rice is uh, a very nice experiment where he has done uh, spin sensitive uh, light scattering. And so what he did observe here is actually the uh, spin structure factor and it has a maximum here. The temperature where this uh, experiment is done is still above the EL temperature. But the one thing I, I want to have in mind here is when we look at the theory for the 3D Hubbard model, and here is the temperature as a function of U. This red line here is the one I really care about at this moment. There is a, a maximum here. So there is a sweet spot for antiferromagnetism, which is about U over T equals eight. So if uh, an experimentalist want to reach the NEL state, this is the best place he should try because the NEL temperature is higher here than it is here and then it is on the other side on the other side where I have not shown the data. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, also for the attractive uh, model, we'll have uh, some sweet spot for ordering. And we are interested in looking for that and giving this information for the experiments. So I'll come now to the attractive Hubbard model, which is basically the same model as before, where I have replaced the sign of the interaction and where it was before a repulsive interaction that in the early model came from a Coulomb repulsion between the electrons. Here we have an attractive interaction that in the early days were phenomenological, but here they can be very realistic in the code atom setup. And what this interaction does is it forces a uh, pair formation and then superfluidity. And so this is a, a system with attractive interactions, but not in the lattice. It's a continuum system. And Mohit uh, pointed me this review he wrote uh, yesterday. And the results are very similar to the ones in the lattice, where what we have here, this is proportional to the interaction strength. And when the interaction is really strong, the, pi, the pairs are really tightly bound. And here the drawing is that the pairs are smaller. And when we reduce the interactions, the pair become bigger. And this is what happens below some, uh, some certain superfluid uh, ordering temperature TC, which is in blue here. And in the normal state, uh, it's also different whether you have strong or uh, not so strong interactions. Here we have a, a region where we have preformed pairs 
So the pairs form somewhere in higher temperature and are present here. And as we decrease the temperature, they acquire some sort of coherence and become superfluid. But if we have um, weaker interactions, we don't have preferment pairs. We only have uh, fermions and they tend to create and condensate at the same time or nearly at the same uh, temperature here. And in this region here, we have a pseudo gap. So this is the picture for uh, attractive fermions without the lattice. But uh, when we do have a lattice, we do have something somewhat similar. And I will explore the similarities here. So here is a phase diagram for temperature as a function of U. And here, where U is large, we have this Bose-Einstein uh, situation where we have strong uh, correlated pairs and tightly bound pairs. And here we have weak interactions where we are in this BCS region where uh, the pairs are not preformed in this region. And this is for a given density 0.7. And here, the basic difference is for large U, we see that there, this line falls down and it falls down as T square over U. And I will uh, comment on this a little bit more. So uh, the attractive Hubbard model has been studied for a long time. And this is a, a, a old results from 92 that show that there is a degenerate Fermi regime above this uh, dashed line here where uh, it's, this is the chemical potential measured from the, the bottom of the band and with the hot shift. So uh, everything that's above this line is in the degenerate Fermi uh, regime. And here uh, also uh, the pairing and spin gap has been probed. So here is the spin susceptibility plot as a function of temperature for different U. And here we see that where the data up departs from RPA, we probably have pairing. And where it goes to zero, it's an indication of a spin gap. So this has been there for a while. And so uh, more recent results show that uh, some calculation actually of this pairing temperature uh, or pseudo gap temperature that's been done through getting the uniform static susceptibility and looking up where the maximum is. So the maximum here for different uh, values of the attraction. And so by looking up at the, the maximum here, we have this uh, dashed black line here that shows the pairing. And in this scale, the superfluid temperature is down here. So once again, we have unpaired uh, fermions in the side. And here we have the preformed pairs that condense down here. So if we do look at these two uh, plots with and without, with the lattice and without, they are very similar. And uh, basically the difference is, of course, the, the temperatures are not the same. But here we see that for the continuum limit, the temperature does not get reduced as the temperature as U is increased, as the interaction is increased. And here we see a clear reduction in the ordering temperature with attraction. So I'm, I'll talk a little bit about the symmetries of the, the, the Hamiltonian. And the first one is the basic particle hole symmetry, because we have written the Hamiltonian in this form, what happens is when I take an electron and turn into uh, a hole, uh, a hole and turn into an electron, uh, what happens is this uh, Hamiltonian maps on itself apart from this chemical potential. So when the chemical potential is set to zero, this side of the the transformed Hamiltonian is absolutely the same as the original one. When we have a square lattice, so this Tij is just equal to T. And so we map on each other. And this is uh, Mark's half filling. So regardless of the temperature, uh, we are at half filling whenever mu is equal to zero 
uh, when we write the Hamiltonian this way. And spin and charge degrees of freedom remain unchanged. We just map uh, electrons into holes and the other way around as well. But there is another uh, transformation that's uh, more interesting in this case, which is the spinned out particle hole transformation that uh, leaves the up spins unchanged. So you do nothing with the up uh, part of the operators, but it takes the down spin operator and turns the distraction operator into a uh, plus operator. So what happens is uh, you particle hole transform only the down spin. And when you do that, something very interesting happens, which is you uh, turn, you change the spin and charge degrees of uh, freedom. And this is NJ up remains NJ up and NJ down goes into N1 minus NJ down. And when you get the sum, which is the density here in the transformed system, you get this minus sign here, which is clearly the spin degrees of freedom. And the other way around, when you work out the spin degrees of freedom, you go to the charge degrees of freedom. And this is very relevant to what we talk from what for what comes next. And what I what I won't show, but is also true is, well, I have shown that the Z uh, part of the spin correlations go into the charge, but also the plus and minus part of the spin correlations go into the superconducting correlations. So when we work out this spin down particle hole transformation in the original repulsive Hubbard model, what happens is we get the plus U term going to the minus U term. So this happens here. And the chemical potential goes into a term that has this N up minus N down and looks and is really a, a Zeeman term uh, in the Hamiltonian. So what happens here is if we set mu equals zero in the side or H equals zero in the side, we do have a uh, half filling and we have a spin balanced system. So we retain the SU2 symmetry, but when we uh, set mu equals zero, we get N different than one in the side. And when we set H different than zero, then we have a uh, spin polarization in this uh, attractive Hamiltonian. So what the Merming-Wagner theorem tells us in D smaller or equal than two, and here I'm interested in two of these systems, is that if I have uh, n components in my order parameter, and if I have that d is bigger than n, then I can have ordering in, in non-zero temperature. If d is less than n, which is the case uh, when we do have SU2, which means half filling repulsive case, or uh, attractive case without the field, then the critical temperature has to be zero. And in this very particular uh, case that we are going to look at, which is D equal to and either off half filling in the attractive case or unpaired uh, system with a polarization uh, in the repulsive case, then we can have uh, a costly Thales transition we get a non-zero temperature. So uh, in the uh, at repulsive case, we at the SU2 point, we have isotropic antiferromagnetism for the repulsive Hubber model or uh, degenerate charge density wave and superfluidity at the attractive Hubbard model. But when this degeneracy is broken uh, away from half filling, what happens is uh, CDW has a, a, a higher energy and we, are, and we stay with superfluidity with a non-zero costly Thales temperature. Or in the anisotropic antiferromagnetism, we can have canted spins at also a non-zero temperature. 
So uh, with this in mind, uh, the uh, phase diagram in the temperature density plane is already known for a while because we do know that at half filling where SU2 symmetry is present, the, the temperature has to go to zero. And at zero density where we have no particles, the temperature, the ordering temperature has to go to zero. And in the middle is something that's not zero. So uh, the, the look, the general look of the phase diagram was known for a while. And this is a, a 2004 result with a summary of all the results also. So uh, this black curve is early quantum Monte Carlo data. This is finite size rescaling transformation. This is uh, Bogolub of Hartree Fock. And all of them have the non-zero temperature in, in intermediate uh, densities and it goes to zero in these two points. So this is expected. So what is known so far is these two uh, slices of a most complete phase diagram, which is the costly house temperature as a function of U for a given density, which in this case is 0.7, or the costly towns temperature as a function of density for a given value of attraction. But what we would like to see is a, a more complete data, which is that 3D plot I've shown in the beginning. And I will uh, spend some time now telling how I came to it. So uh, in the reason why we would like to know this more accurately, the temperature, the ordering temperature, is that because of the atomic resolution imaging that become available in 2009 for bosons and uh, more recently for fermions. So there is, uh, this is kind of outdated already, but in 2015, there are six groups in the world that had this, um, on this atomic image resolution for fermions. And with that, there has come uh, some very interesting experiments that, that can explore this um, costly Tau's transition. The first one I'm talking about is not in the attractive Hubbard model, but in the repulsive uh, Hubbard model in 2D, but with spin and balance. And so here is just a, a nice plot of the atomic resolution of the lithium cloud. And here is, uh, what they have done is uh, kick out some uh, downspins of the system so that this is the, the whole cloud. This is the uh, up uh, fermions clown cloud that is the one here in green as a function of the radius. And here is the downspins. And here is the on-site uh, as, as a function of radius polar local polarization, which is just uh, up minus down divided by up plus down. So what we see here, we have a clearly, clearly a spin and balance in this system. So uh, although there was no Zeeman field uh, in the experiment, the Hamiltonian that explains the experiment does have some sort of Zeeman field uh, like that is uh, responsible for uh, explaining the kicking out of the either plus uh, up or down system. So the way uh, the experiments are done, uh, some atoms are removed. Uh, so in this window here, the up uh, atoms are removed. And in this panel here, the down atoms are removed. But apart from that, they also measure the spin-spin correlations along the z direction and also by doing a pi over two rotation perpendicular to the z direction. And they have done this in uh, a wide range of polarizations going from zero, which is the spin balanced case, 2.9, which is the very unbalanced limit. And so what's obtained here is uh, the, the blue symbols are experiment data and the small uh, data here are uh, 
either quantum Monte Carlo or the lines are numerical leaked cluster expansion data. And the range here is because uh, these are done in a window of temperature that are trying to encompass all the experimental data. So in the yellow here, I am showing the ZZ spin correlation function. And in the uh, negative part here, we have the ZZ correlation function for near neighbors. So we expect them to be negative because we have antiferromagnetism. And here is the along the diagonal spin-spin uh, correlations, and they are positive because they are second neighbor correlations. And so the yellow is along the Z direction and in blue, it's perpendicular to Z. So it's along the plane. And here is some anisotropy measurement where uh, we just divide the Z correlations by the perpendicular correlations. And we do see here that when it's done for near neighbor, it has some lower value that for uh, second neighbor. And what this reinforces is uh, spin correlations are more reduced, so they are closer to zero along the Z direction than uh, the ones in the plane. So we are seeing some cunting of the spins. And so this is a sketch of the phase diagram. So here is the isotropic system uh, without the field. And here is the completely polarized uh, system. So here we have isotropic antiferromagnetism. And in this region in blue here, we do have a canted spins. So the actual experiment is here on a higher temperature, and this is the temperature in uh, units of hopping. So the temperature is like 0.4. And here is uh, the boundary of the costerly Taos uh, region. And the thing is, this uh, border here is taken uh, from uh, the attractive Hubbard model, and I'll come to it in a bit. And so um, the costly house temperature maximum here is around 0.15, which is in the system is 3.3 nanokelvin, it's really low. But these estimates are for an attractive system with U over T equals minus four. And the experiments here are done with the repulsive system with U over T equals eight. So how realistic is this boundary here for this experiment is one thing. And there is another recent experiment, which I'm not going to discuss uh, very much, but it's this one is in actually in the attractive Hubbard uh, model at U over T equals minus five. So closer to the, the known value. And here we have, uh, once again, the experiments are done at this temperature around 0.45 in hopping units. But here we see the, the phase diagram where the sketch of the phase diagram with the cost of the house temperature going to about 0.15. So once again, we are closer now because we are in the at attractive uh, system in both cases. But here we are off a little from the known value of the uh, costly house temperature. So just to reinforce the current experiments are uh, way above the ordering temperature, either 0.4 or 0.45, and uh, either repulsive or attractive. And the estimates for the costly house temperature are around 0.15 and are obtained for U equals T equals minus four. So this is work in progress. I, I know people usually give a talk when they have the work ready, but I am I kind of overestimated what I could do while doing some remote teaching. So the work is not ready. But on the other hand, I can, you know, get input from the audience and see if you give me some great ideas to finish this work. And this is a uh, uh, Brazilian made only uh, work with Nathanael. Pimentel and Raimundo, who is in the audience. 
And so what we are set up to do is really uh, check out whether there is a sweet spot for the cost of lethals transition and try to provide accurate uh, values for the cost of lethals temperature for a wide range of parameters that might be interesting for the experimental experimentalist. And one nice thing about the attractive Hubbard model is it's free from sign problems. So we don't need to worry about that. And we are going obviously to use quantum Monte Carlo uh, to find this uh, temperature transition. So uh, when dealing with a uh, pairing, uh, looking for the cost of the Faust transition and looking at superfluidity, we are going to look at the pairing correlation function. And so here is just how it's defined. So we create, uh, uh, we destroy a pair in a site and create it in another site and, and see the correlation, uh, they are distance uh, a site, um, they are distant apart uh, a, a distance i minus j. And this is a plot of the pairing correlation function as a function of distance. And this, this was taken along the diagonal and eta is the inverse temperature. And this is in, in a fairly large lattice, 18 by 18. And what we see is as we reduce the temperature, we uh, stabilize the pairing correlation function as a function of distance. So we are seeing pairing uh, going through all our lattice. And how do we find the cost of Lithau's temperature from this pairing correlation function? And there are basically two ways of doing that. The first one is using some phenomenological renormalization group that uh, goes this way. So we have the pairing function as a function of inverse temperature here. And the first thing I want to stress is that uh, as we increase system size, as we show here, they uh, start to, they flatten and they start to flatten at lower and lower temperature. And this flattening is of course a, a, a sign of the, that the correlations have reached all our lattice. And L here is the linear size of our systems. And uh, in the cost of Lithau's phase transition, what we see is that the correlations decay algebraically. So uh, for temperatures between zero and this ordering temperature, what we have is that the correlations fall with uh, minus eta. And this eta is a, uh, coefficient that depends on temperature for uh, zero temperature, it is zero. And in the cost of Lithau's temperature, it's known to be one fourth. And so when we integrate the correlation functions uh, over the 2D uh, system with linear size L, what we see is that this, um, this expression here, that the pairing should go to L should go with L minus two and the coefficient here and some function that depends only on L over C where C is the correlation length that uh, diverges exponentially. So we can do some plotting with L minus seven four, which is two minus one four here and here this L times the uh, correlation length and we should see a, a, a collapse of all the data. And this is what we see here. And this plot has been done by Nathanael and he was really careful to change A. This is a feeding parameter A and the temperature is also extracted from the feeding. And here at the point where we have the smaller chi is the, the, temp, the A we take and then we extract the temperature. The thing with uh, this kind of fitting is that it is very sensible to system size. So this expression here only holds in the thermodynamic limit. And so in early calculations, when only smaller system sizes were available, there seems to be a collapse for some given values of TC and, and A. And when we do uh, 
this is not, I was going to say nowadays, but this is 16 years ago that we reached largest system sizes. We see that the collapse is good here for the smaller lattice sizes, but that the bigger lattices are far away from collapsing. So what we did is like change the parameters here and, and we found that the ordering temperature was really a lot larger than it was early expected because of the uh, larger system sizes that were available then. So we get a higher TC than was expected before. And the other way of extracting uh, the costly thaws temperature is through the elicity modulus. And so the elicity modulus is expected to have a jump at here at DC. So if we plot this line here, which is 2t over pine and the elicity modulus where they meet is an estimate of the, of the ordering temperature. And so we extract this elicity modulus. It, it's uh, basically dependent on the uh, drood weight and, and it's given by the uh, longitudinal and transverse, uh, let me go to the next slide, uh, parts of the current current correlation function. So we start with the X component current density correlate, correlation uh, operator, and then we get the current current correlation, and then we pull here transform, and then we take the Q going to X limit and Q going to Y limit separately. And then from this, we get the LST modulus. And this is a plot of the elicity modulus. And here is the uh, dashed line that is the DC uh, 2t over pi. And so here where they meet is uh, the cost of the thousand transition uh, estimate. And we do see that uh, if we take large enough system sizes, there is not much fluctuation here. So they pretty much agreed and, and we can use this variation as error bars. So we do repeat this for a number of different U over T and a number of different densities. And we get these two plots they actually have the same results. They are just plot differently. So this is the cost of the transition as a function of U for different densities. And this is the same quantity as a function of N for different values of U. The first thing we realize here by looking at this plot here on the left is that the maximum lies at U over T equals five for all the densities we have analyzed. So this is, the U that should be used in experiments because this is the one that maximizes uh, the temperature. And also, uh, if we look here and here, this is the actual maximum for uh, the, the transition. And we see that uh, for U equal to equals five, either having 0.7 or 0.87 uh, density leads to the same result because in this plot here, it's easier to see they are flat. And this is the maximum uh, cost of the thaus transition we obtained. I forgot to divide here by T, but this is in units of hopping. And here for U equals T over six, which is right beside here, we have similar result, but this is where the temperature is higher. So uh, this is just a 3D plot with all these results. And with this, the, the red region here is the sweet spot for uh, the costly thaus transition and where experiments should uh, focus on where when doing experiments on the attractive Hubbard model. So uh, I guess I was really fast, but uh, the conclusions I, I come to, there is a, a sweet spot for superconductivity in the attractive Hubbard model. This sweet spot is 
around U equals T E for five. This is where the cost of house temperature is maximum for all the densities. But if we can control the density in experiments, it's good to keep it in this range between 0.7 and 0.87. And this is the actual uh, best estimate we have so far. And there are things to do. Uh, as I said, this is work in uh, progress. So we do want to analyze the BEC to BCS crossover in further detail and obtain the pairing temperature also with more detail. So I guess that's it. And so just to finish, uh, thank you all for your attention and just highlight the funding I have. So that's it. Thank you very much, Teresa. Now, any one of the audience who have questions, you are free to unmute yourself. We are allowing people to unmute yourself. Let me just. Ah, I didn't allow people to. Okay, now you're allowed to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, I have a I have an outsider's question. As someone who never did quantum Monte Carlo. Why is the attractive Hubbard model sign free? Yeah, oh, can I? So who is asking? Can I? I feel. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> um, okay, yes. I can see you now. Sorry, I was rolling up and down. So uh, it's because of the way the uh, Hubbard Stratonovich is, uh, the, the charter, the composition is done. So in this case, uh, the uh, up and down uh, determinants are the same. So the product is uh, always positive definite. And so this is really nice when doing simulation. Uh, hi, thanks. I have a question. Uh, um, the 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 cost of the style is temperature is going to zero at half filling, and I'm kind of assuming that's because of a competition with charge density wave. It is, yeah. So I guess what I'm further wanting to know is is if there is initially at least like when I look at this figure and and um, as a function of n, if initially there's an enhancement due to charge density waves, or or the you know because with with charge density waves, there's um, well, I, I, there are reasons why it might help the critical temperature for superconductivity. I guess my question is, can you explore um, T prime not equal to zero to actually look at that issue? Yes. Yeah, so if you set uh, T prime uh, not equal to zero, you're going to destroy some of those symmetry I've shown and then uh, everything will be different. So you won't have particle hole symmetry, for instance. Uh, and probably you won't have this uh, spin down particle hole symmetry as well. And this uh, will lead to, uh, you can raise this degeneracy uh, with uh, uh, near neighbor hopping, for instance. So this is something that could be done. Thank you. Uh, hi, Teresa. This is Luis Gregorio from USP. How are you? Hi, Luis. Good. Very nice talk. Uh, my question is, very, very basic. I'd like to, if you could go back to that slide where you show the argument based on the mermin wagner theorem. I'd like to understand better uh, what's the argument saying that the, the transition is possibly tallest. Uh, oops. Maybe I can. I should, oops, here, yeah, I yes. guess, yeah. 
so what's the the question so if you have uh d the number of order parameters uh, the the size of your or the number of components in your order parameter equal to uh the 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 dimensionality of your system then you have a cost of the Faust transition at a non-zero temperature and okay. this is uh, not the case when uh we have the balanced system or at half filling where you, we have su2 symmetry but when uh either we dope the attractive system and we break the 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 generacy between superfluid and cdw then this happens or in the anisotropic uh, antiferromagnetism when we have counted uh, spins that the z direction uh, correlation functions are actually different and high and have more energy than the xy correlation functions, then also we have a cost of the Tau's transition. And this is what's seen in, in those experiments, either the uh, repulsive with uh, Zeeman field or the attractive of half feeling. So, so the N, N is two in both of these cases. That's, yeah. That's the idea. Okay. That's the idea. Either uh, the, sur the superfluid uh, uh, or the parameter which has two components or the XY uh, antiferromagnetism which has two components as well. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any other question? Oh, we don't see any questions. So let's thank Teresa again. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank and you all for coming. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.